Okay, this morning, we're going to be starting a new series called Identity Crisis. A crisis of identity that is not only pervasive in our world, but has caused some of the ugliest things about our world. Um, I don't have to tell you that cultural discourse in our world today is now characterized by raging disagreement and division. People, it's not enough anymore just to have a difference of opinion. Those opinions rage against each other. Uh, I was in the, I think I shared with you, I was in the UK a few years ago. We normally spend New Year's in the UK. So we were at a New Year's Eve party uh, just a couple hours west of London. And we were there with family and friends and we were having a great time. I mean, we were catching up with everybody. Everybody was excited about the new year uh, coming in. Everything was going well until I said, so what do y'all think about Brexit? <laughs> okay, all right. So apparently there is a difference of opinion <laughs> regarding, because when I said that, the entire room froze over. I, could, I was almost like, I felt like people were saying, who invited this guy? <laughs> you know, I just, I kill the spirit. Why? Because there are deeply held disagreements about so many things in our culture. Now, it brings up an interesting question. How does that happen? In other words, how can two different people or two different groups of people observe the same set of facts the same circumstances, the same scenarios, and come to such different conclusions about those same set of facts. How does that happen? And not only that, how do their differences of opinion, how are they so deeply held? How, are they, how do they cause people to beat each other's throats many times? Well, the answer to that question has everything to do with something called a worldview. A worldview. What is a worldview? A worldview is the lens through which you perceive and respond to the world around you. Everybody has a worldview. Your worldview and my worldview have, has, have developed over a long period of time. Our worldviews include certain assumptions about life, the way things are, certain preferences, certain biases that are built into our worldview that colors the way we process and respond to things in our world. That's what a worldview is. Now, as when, when you have these disagreements that are raging against each other, that explains why some of our, dis, our disagreements are so uh, are so. There's so much hatred almost in some of our disagreements because opinions don't live in a vacuum. Opinions are deeply rooted in a worldview. Uh, that's why when you talk to somebody about an issue and they have a different perspective than you have, that's why many times, most times, they are just as convinced that they are right and you are wrong as you are convinced that you are right and they are wrong. They're, they're equally convinced because their beliefs are deeply rooted in a very different worldview. Now, of course, the question is, in a world filled with different worldviews and different opinions and different beliefs, is there a tiebreaker? Is there something that says, okay, this one of all the worldviews, this one is right and all others are wrong. Well, as Christians, we believe that God's views are the right views. A godly biblical worldview is the right worldview. Now, why do we believe that? Because God knows more because God knows all. God knows everything there is to know. So if God presents a perspective on something, it is the right perspective perspective. So as believers, here's what that means to us. As believers, we do our very best to have a biblical worldview, a biblical worldview. In other words, we do our very best 
to process and respond to the world through the lens of the Bible instead of perceiving and responding to the Bible through the lens of the world. We try to let God's perspective inform our opinions and our responses. Over the next few weeks, I want to examine the difference between a biblical worldview and a secular culture's worldview surrounding one question. It is a vitally important question, not only because we all ask, uh, all ask this question, but because the implications of our answers are enormous. Here's the question we're going to look at. What does it mean to be human? Who are you really? Who are we as human beings? Who are we really? See, different people in different groups from different worldviews answer that question very, very differently. Culture generally answers that question from a secular, unbiblical worldview. And here's what I'm going to suggest over the next several weeks. It's that secular worldview that is responsible for some of the ugliest things about our world. When you look at things like racism and murder and abortion and neglect and abuse, feelings of superiority and inferiority, all of these things that we would all agree are so ugly about our world, all of those things have their root in a secular worldview's answer to the question, what does it mean to be human? But I'm also going to suggest that the biblical worldview is not only the right worldview, but the best one. Our world would be a much better place if people knew who they really were. People knew who they really were. This global identity crisis has created division and characterized by hatred and all the rest, a biblical worldview gives another option, a better option. So from a biblical worldview, what does it mean to be human? We're gonna begin at the very beginning. If you have your Bibles with you, turn to the very first chapter in your Bible, Genesis chapter one. Now, now if you're a student of the Old Testament, you know that Genesis chapter one describes how God created the world. How God created the stars and the land and the sea and the fish and the birds and the animals and all the things that he created. And then we come to verse 26, where he created humans. And the Bible says this, Genesis chapter one, verse 26. Then God said, after he'd created all those other things, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. Verse 27. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. He created them. All right. Those two verses Christians are the starting point for understanding what the Bible has to say about what it means to be human. I want to spend the rest of my time this morning describing how the Bible says that human beings are created by God in his image. That's what Genesis chapter one tells us. What does the Bible have to say about what it means to be human? Human beings are created by God in his image. Now, right off the bat, right off the bat, you can't get through the first chapter of the Bible until you see the disagreement here. Because secularism answers this question very, very differently. Instead of being created, secularism will say, you evolved over millions of years from uh, simple organisms through the process of evolution. Now, let me just stop here because I know many of you follow these things. I know, I understand, 
Evolution, especially in the last decade or so, has lost a lot of its credibility. I get that, I know that. Um, the facts have blown so many holes in this theory, it is almost unsustainable anymore. It's not, it's almost, many evolutionists are abandon the, abandoning the theory of evolution. I understand that. However, in general, a secular culture is still holding on to this theory. Now, why is that? Why would a secular, why would secularism hold tightly to a failed theory? When, when the facts show something different, why would secularism be so committed to that theory? Here's why. Because they hold to a secular worldview. A secular worldview that says there cannot be a creator. If there is a creator, that means we are all accountable to that creator. And that simply cannot be. So they will overlook facts. They will overlook truth to be able to cling to this worldview. It's a, simple, uh, a deeply seated belief. Don't take my word for it. I'll quote for you an agnostic Darwinist from Harvard University. Now listen carefully to what this gentleman says. He says, quote, we take the side of science in spite of, we take the side of science in spite of the patent absurdity of some of its constructs. In spite of its failure to fulfill many of its extravagant promises of health and life. In spite of the tolerance of the scientific community for unsubstantiated just so stories. Let me just stop there. So why is it that secularists will hold so tightly to the theory of evolution in spite of all of its failures? He tells us why. Because we have a prior commitment to materialism. Mater that materialism is absolute for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. You know what he just said? We are willing to accept all the problems with this theory of evolution because to do otherwise would, do the unth would require the unthinkable, to acknowledge a divine creator. And that simply cannot be. But that is the theory that secularists hold to. You know who you are? You know what it means to be human? You are a, you are a, a grouping of cells that are not unlike any other grouping of cells. Now, here's what I wanna do in the time I have left. I wanna share with you the implications of the biblical worldview of what it means to be human as created in beings in God's image. And I wanna share with you how it compares to what secularism would lead to. So first, given what the Bible says about what it means to be human, every human being has inherent dignity and value. According to the biblical worldview, every human being, regardless of who they are, has inherent dignity and value. Okay. According to a secular worldview, where you're just a collection of cells, your value cannot be inherent. And let me say that a different way. Human beings, according to an evolutionist, have no more inherent value than a cockroach or a worm or any other living organism on the face of the planet because a grouping of cells is just a grouping of cells. Now we're more advanced, we're more sophisticated, but inherent value cannot be ascribed to you because you are the same as every other collection of cells in the world, you see. Now, when you adopt that worldview, here's what happens. You get exactly what we see. Now let me explain why. Let me say what I mean by that. According to a secular worldview, your value is not inherent. 
So your value must be earned. It becomes a function of achievement. Your value is determined by what you're able to do and what you're able to contribute. So when you adopt that kind of secular worldview when answering the question, what does it mean to be human? Here's what that leads to. If a baby is either unborn or newborn, since that baby cannot and has not contributed, that baby becomes expendable because it has no inherent value. If it's not wanted, it can be expend it's expendable. An adult who comes to a point in life where they are no longer able to contribute, that life is also has no inherent value and is expendable. If according to a secular worldview, it is perfectly okay, it is perfectly okay to exploit the poor and the weak as long as it leads to someone else's achievement and advancement, you see. See, the secular worldview points to some of the ugliest things we see in our world. But the Bible teaches something different. The Bible teaches that as a created person in God's image, your value is inherent to you. It is not earned. You have it before you. You are valuable regardless of what you're able to do or not do. Let me give you an example. This past week, I wanted to know, I wanted to know what the most expensive painting in the world was at the moment. And I, here's what I found. There is a painting called a Salvatore Mundi. Salvatore Mundi, it's the pictures on the screen. Uh, this painting four years ago in 2017, sold for $450 million. $450 million for this painting. Now there are a lot of questions. Uh, uh, the first question is where do they go to church? You know, 450 million, that's a lot of money. 450, now here's what I, here's what I was curious about. So I, uh, I have a friend who is a painter. So I texted him and I said, you know, if, if someone were to buy the materials necessary to create that painting, the, the wood, the canvas, the oil paint, all the rest, how much would it cost? And he told me it would cost no more than $500. Okay, now let's get our heads around this. We have a painting wh whose uh, elements are worth no more than $500 that sold for $450 million. Question, why did that painting sell for so much money? Answer, it was painted by Leonardo da Vinci. You see, its value was not in what it was comprised of. Its value was found in who created it, who put all of those things together to create a masterpiece you, regardless of who you are, regardless of what you can or cannot do, regardless of what you have or do not have, you are a priceless masterpiece pieced together by the master, the creator of the universe. And go ahead, that's a, it's, and here's, what, here's what's important to understand. That has nothing to do with achievement. In fact, Psalm 139, listen to these verses. Many of you know these well. Uh, speaking of God here, the psalmist says, you created my inmost being. You knit me together. You put me together when I was born. No. When I, was I graduated from school. No. When I was finally able to contribute and take care of myself. No. You knit me together in my mother's womb before I could do anything, before I, was, before I was independent at all. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. You see, your value and dignity is inherent because you are the master's masterpiece. He put you together. Number two, second implication of the biblical worldview here. Every human being 
bears God's image. Every human being, every human being bears God's image. Now this makes human beings very unique. When you read Genesis, God created all the animals, all the birds, all the fish. But it wasn't until he came to humans, to mankind, that he said, I am going to make humans in my image. Okay, you are far more than just an advanced animal. You are distinct from all animals because you bear the image of the creator. Now, what does that mean? What does that mean that we bear God's image? It basically means, I don't have time to go into a lot of this. It really means that we are a reflection of the one who created us. For example, we have an intellect and a will. You and I can assess information, make an informed decision, even when that decision might cause us sacrifice or cost us something. We have the ability to make informed decisions. We have the ability to recognize and appreciate beauty, just like our God does. We have the ability uh, to have a moral awareness. We are creative. We can take things and put them together and create something that has never been there before. Many ways we reflect the image of the one who created us. But here's the difference. A secular worldview looks at something completely different. A secular worldview doesn't define us by what we have in common as image bearers of God. A secular culture defines us by our differences. A secular culture will say you are defined by relatively superficial differences. For example, you know who you are? You're defined by the color of your skin. That's what culture will say. You are defined by your gender. That's, that's who you are. Uh, you are defined by whatever talent or ability you might have. That's who you are. And here's what happens. When a culture focuses on and defines people based on their differences, you reap an antagonistic brand of tribalism where different tribes rage against each other because of and over their differences. You see, it's, it's the secular worldview, the secular worldview that fans the flames of things like racism and bigotry and class warfare and all of the division we see rooted in a secular worldview of human identity. But a w biblical worldview points to what we all share. Human similarities far outweigh human differences, according to the Bible. There's far more that unites us as image bearers of our creator than should divide us. This week is uh, homecoming down on the flats at my alma mater. I went to Georgia Tech, if you're new. Pray for me this season. <laughs> so let me tell you what this week is. This week is homecoming. Homecoming down at Georgia Tech. So Here's what will happen. I've lived down there for many years. I know exactly what the week's going to include. All week long, different organizations on campus are going to be competing against each other. There are all these events, they compete for points. And at the game on Saturday, at the homecoming game, at halftime, the winning organization will be announced. Okay, so all the organizations are fighting against each other because they all want to win. But here's what's going to happen. On Saturday, those different organizations are going to walk into Grant Field and they're going to sit in the stands and they are going to cheer on their team. Assuming there's something to cheer about. They're going to cheer on their team. They're going to join together in perfect harmony. In that moment, it's going to become clear. While there are things that make them different, there is far more that makes them the same. They're all Georgia Tech students. They're all Georgia Tech fans, bless their hearts. But, the, but they're all together. There's far more that unites them than divides them. That's the way a biblical worldview works. Imagine church, just stop and dream for a minute. Imagine a world 
where everyone looked at everyone else and didn't see what made them different, but saw what made them the same. In other words, imagine a world that looked at everyone through a biblical lens and saw the image of God being born in everyone around them. What a difference that would make. Lastly, every human being, according to the biblical worldview, every human being has a purpose. If you just happened, you're an accident. You're not here for any reason. However, if you were designed and created, design and creation points to a purpose. You don't design and create something without a purpose in mind. God created us as human beings with a purpose in mind. Okay, Pastor Jeff, if God created me with a purpose, for a purpose, what purpose did he create me for? Isaiah chapter 43, verse seven. God says, everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. Okay. What is our purpose? God created human beings for his glory. Okay, every single person is here to make a big deal about God. It's to make, it's to draw a lot of attention to God, it's to glorify God. That's why Paul in the New Testament would say something like this. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God because that's why we're here. That's what you're here for. Now, a secular worldview suggests something very different. A secular worldview where you have no purpose, no, no externally defined purpose, a secular worldview says you're not here for anyone else. You're not here for God. You're here for you. You're here for you. Your life is all about you. Your life should be about having what you want, what you prefer, what you desire. It's all about you. See, in a secular worldview, what you want, what your preferences are, those are what reign supreme. And whatever you have to do to have what you want, what you think is best for you, is what you should do. I'll give you a perfect example of the way this plays out in culture. Uh, in the very next chapter of Genesis, God creates the very first institution for mankind. He creates the institution of marriage. He creates Eve, puts Adam and Eve together. They are the first married couple. They are covenant together. Uh, God created the institution of marriage. Now, like everything else in God's creation, everything God creates is for his glory. Now, let me ask you a question. Is marriage for your good? Of course it is. Marriage is intended by God to be a great blessing in, in and to our lives. A marriage according to God's design and plan can be one of the greatest blessings in your life. But hear me well. Marriage is not primarily for you. Marriage is primarily for God. Everything God creates, he creates for his glory. Now, a secular worldview will say, look, it's all about you. So if, you're, if you have a marriage and, you know, you're not, you're what you want, you're not getting what you want or what you need, you're not happier anymore, then that marriage is all of a sudden meaningless. It doesn't mean anything anymore. It's not really a marriage anymore. Or here's one. If your desire or preference is to marry someone of the same sex, we can just redefine marriage to be whatever you want it to be because marriage is all about you and what you want, your desires, your feelings, your impulses reign supreme. Okay, like all of God's creation, marriage was created not for us. It was created for him. For example, marriage was created by God to make a big deal out of God by showing a, 
by giving a picture of how two very different people, a man and a woman, could come together in spite of their differences in perfect union and harmony, just like Jesus did with a fallen man, the son of God and fallen mankind, how Jesus it can enjoy perfect union, unity with his bride, the church. It's a picture God gave us in marriage. Uh, marriage is intended to be a demonstration, a picture of what selfless and unconditional sacrificial love looks like. Just like the love that God showed to us when he sent his son to die in our place. Marriage is meant to make a big deal out of God by giving us a picture of what a covenant is. Something that cannot and will not be broken just like the covenant that God makes with us. You see, we are not we are not here for ourselves and God is not here for us. We ultimately are here for him to bring honor and glory to our creator. What does it mean to be human? According to the Bible, here's what it means to be human. You were created by God in his image for his glory. Boy, what a difference that worldview would make in our world. We were created by God in his image for his glory. Life seen through any other lens, I'm just gonna tell you, is gonna fall short of the joy, the peace, the fulfillment that we all want and that God intends for all of us. As I close, let me ask you a question. I wonder wonder if there might be those hear it either here in the room or watching online and you've tried all you know to try you you have put forth your very best effort to try to discover what life's really all about you search for those things we all search for peace joy happiness fulfillment meaning purpose and everything that you've tried has fallen short and if you're honest you would say pastor jeff I haven't found it yet. Well, let me encourage you to look to God for the answers because you were created to live in relationship with your creator. I say this all the time. If you're trying to live life as a solo flight, you are doing something God never intended anybody to attempt. You were created to live in perfect relationship with your creator made possible only by the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ on your behalf to cover your sins. If you've never looked to God for the answers, I would like to encourage you at the end of this service, as I close out our sermon, to reach out to God, to ask, invite him into your life so that you can once and for all enjoy the relationship you were intended to have with him. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. If you're the one I'm talking to, I invite you to pray along with me out of your heart, something something like this. Dear God, I recognize I stand in need of your forgiveness. I, uh, I believe that Jesus, your son, died in my place, paid for my sin, and then three days later, he rose from the dead. I believe that. And right now, I'm confessing to you my trust in what Jesus did for me, not only to rescue me from my sin, but to grant to me the, perf- the perfection, the righteousness that you require for a relationship with you. Receive me into your family as I give my life to Jesus, your son. In his name I pray, amen. Everyone looking up here, if that was your heartfelt prayer, I'd like to offer you some help. Uh, out at guest services, which is located out in our grand foyer, we've prepared some packets of information for you. Uh, that information just explains, what does it mean to ask God for forgiveness? What does it mean to place my faith in what Jesus did for me? That information explains all of that more fully. We'd love to give it to you. Just go by and request it. They'll put it in your hand. You can be on your way. If you're watching online and you prayed along with me this morning, we would love to send you the same literature in the mail to your home. 
We can receive your mailing address. If you'll simply go to imadeadecision.com. It's a website, imadeadecision.com. There's a form to fill out there. Fill it in, send it to us, and we'll put some literature in the mail to your home this coming week. Thank you for watching this video on First Redeemer's YouTube channel. If you enjoyed it, click like below and leave us a comment. And if you'd like more content like this, click subscribe and turn on your notifications. Thanks again for watching.